Catherine Harris was Clayton Roberts' boss, and her boss was Jeb Bush. But she also happened to be chairwoman of the Bush for President campaign and successfully delivered W a victory by just 537 votes. Now that the votes are counted, it is time for the votes to count. I wish to point out that our American democracy has triumphed once again. It is a special day for America. It's a day in which our nation confirms the fact that we trust democracy, a peaceful transfer of power. Thank you, and may God bless America. To the corporations that put him into the White House, George W. Bush was an investment that paid off big time. Take that company that came up with the phony felon list, Choice Point. They got it 95% wrong, but they didn't get the boot. They got the big no-bid contracts, including one for $67 million to help Bush fight his war on terror. And they weren't the only company involved in Bush's election to hit the White House jackpot. George W. Bush, uh, as governor and now as president, is an absolute corporate wet dream. Jim Hightower, once the commissioner of agriculture for the state of Texas, is now a radio columnist. From inside government and out, he's tracked the Bush family's mix of politics and payouts for years. I'd trust a wolf to guard my last pork chop before I'd trust the Bushites to guard my liberties. Any fantasy that the boss of a major corporation has can come true uh, if you just put in uh, some money uh, into Bush's personal or political pockets. Looks powerful, looks invincible. In fact, it's the gravestone here in Houston of what was the largest power corporation on this planet, Enron. Here's something that caught my eye. Bush takes office. Just three days later, he signs an executive order that raises the price of electricity in California. Nearly bankrupts that state, but earns these guys billions. Now, why would our president do that? They're very loyal to each other and to those who are loyal to them. They stand and deliver for those who put money into their politics or into their personal accounts. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly this way, that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. Enron puts in a few hundred thousand dollars into Bush's presidential campaign. In the first five or six months of the administration, it reaps hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in personal benefit. Here's Ken Lay, who's the CEO of Enron. He delivered hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Bush campaign. Craig McDonald heads Texans for Public Justice. This is the power team. They hit the long ball, and they can put you all the way in the White House. The payback process is policy. It's appointments and policy. Ken Lay, Enron, the oil cronies got exactly what they wanted out of the Bush administration. Even before he takes the presidential oath, Bush forms a secret task force, including Enron's Ken Lay, to rewrite America's environmental and energy laws. He put the very people who funded him in the room to devise a clean air policy. They wrote the policy, he enacted the policy, and the policy was strictly voluntary. Did nothing to clean up the air, yet he touted it as a major accomplishment. Instead of the government telling utilities where and how to cut pollution, we will give them a firm deadline and let them find the most innov innovative ways to meet it. 
these same funders were sick and tired of trying to play by the environmental rules and regulations. George Bush gave them an environmental clean air policy uh, that any corporation would lust after. How proud we are to be the number one state in the country in air pollution. took the clean air and the environmental cops off the beat. Ken Lay got almost total, complete energy deregulation out of George Bush. <laughs> what did the Bush administration do? It refused to impose price controls to put a cap on those utility prices, meaning a company could, like Enron could set its own prices to consumers. Show me the money. Show me the money. He was delivering a favor and a policy that the donors who put him in that office wanted. Consumers in California were being stiffed, and Enron was raking in hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, during that period uh, in corrupt profits. Uh, so that's a pretty good payback. But Enron squandered their California windfall in a series of spectacular frauds, which imploded, leaving thousands jobless and pensioners bankrupt. Now, George tried to downplay his links with Enron's Ken Lay and other corrupt bosses. By far, the vast majority of CEOs in America are good, honorable, honest people. In the corporate world, sometimes things aren't exactly black and white when it comes to accounting procedures. And the SEC's job is to, re is to, is to look and is to determine whether or not, uh, whether, or not uh, uh, whether or not the decision by the auditors was the appropriate decision. <laughs> Ken Lay, uh, whom George W. fondly called Kenny Boy, was the major campaign contributor to George W. Bush, and they exchanged Christmas cards with each other. Uh, Ken Lay was very personal, uh, very close uh, with the Bush family. I do know that uh, uh, Mr. Lay came to the White House in early in my administration, along with, uh, I think, 20 other business leaders to discuss the state of the economy. It was just kind of a general discussion. I have not met with him personally. I've gotten my hands on a video of an Enron retirement party for one of Ken Lay's colleagues. It stars both Presidents Bush more than happy to say a few encouraging words for their family's top campaign contributors. You have been fantastic to the Bush family. I don't think anybody did more than you did to support George. Don't leave Texas. You're too good a man. I appreciate your service to our great state. I look forward to working with you to make Texas a better place. Good luck in anything you do. You're a good Texan. Capitol Hill, Austin, Texas. It's here where George W. made the deals that got him into the White House and where he learned his own particular brand of politics, Texas style. When the deals go down, Texas gentlemen sometimes don't like to get their hands dirty with the details. For that, they have hired guns. The political lobbyists. Across from the Capitol, I found one of Ken Lay's former lobbyists, Andrea McWilliams. She and her husband sell their political connections to the Texas corporate elite. They also rounded up over $100,000 in contributions for George W. Bush's presidential campaign. If every person in the United States could meet President Bush, they would understand why we have the level of support personally that we do for the president. He is an, an honest, equitable, hard-working man, and that's why we've supported him unequivocally. Um, and I think he's doing a fabulous job. I crossed the hall to meet another lobbyist. Nick Kroll invited me into the back room to show me a different view of the influence game. Nice to see you. Hey, Uncle great. Jason. Come on in. Yeah, great. Want a cocktail? Ah, uh, yeah. Why not? <laughs> okay, 
Yeah, we don't want you to speak ill of us. All right. Cheers. Mm. Damn fine whiskey. Now, do you ever use that as a mechanism for uh, getting what you want in the Always. legislature? The second most important, well, third most important tool in politics. Well, what are the others? Guns and what? Money, probably number one, but whiskey's a close second. What's third? Love, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Get our lobby tools ready. <laughs> okay, next point. You have a few enemies here? Sure. I'm a minority, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> An endangered species. Huh? That's right. The simple process of getting things done in Texas, how important is cash in getting legislation through? Well, it's the fuel of politics. I mean, that's how you get people that identify with your views elected. It is probably unseemly in many ways because Texas is unlike a lot of places. There's no limit. If you're running for a house seat, I could give you a hundred, two hundred. I could give you as much hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, much money as I want. And obviously, that's going to have some effect on how you treat me. Say, come on now. You are representing guys like uh, and Ron. You're saying that these companies make that type of investment and don't expect a return. I think some of the donors that, that you're speaking of, um, and, and there's a long list that have traditionally given to what they feel like are business friendly candidates. And, and those donors don't necessarily uh, look for any sort of quid pro quo other than uh, the candidate's ideology that they're supporting they know will help uh, help change the, the business environment or the climate for the better. What I would say about President Bush is that there, there is no way giving to someone like him is going to influence his decision. There's no quid pro quo. Sounds like bullshit to me. <laughs> so this is kind of the wild west of campaign contributions? It is the wild west. Is this a 45? Then? I don't know if there are any other states that have as uh, liberal uh, campaign contributions. Unlimited, you can give a million if you want to give a million, or you can give whatever. There's the old saying, money talks and bullshit walks. And money talks very politely to the Bush family. Not just the campaign cash for George W. and Brother Jeb. There was the billion dollars the U.S. Treasury pumped into Brother Neil's bank, Silverado. And there's Brother Marvin. His investment funds are fattening on contracts for the war on terror. And Poppy, Bush Sr., became the first ex-president to trade his Oval Office connections for cash. The Bushes are like other American dynasties. The, the Kennedys, the, the Rockefellers. They made their millions and bought their way into political office. The Bushes do the same, but with a twist. They've taken the game to a whole other level. See, the money gets them office, then the office gets them even more money. Call it the Bush cycle. And it's still rolling along. I went to speak to a man who'd witnessed the Bush family's uncanny ability to turn government service into cash. He'd occupied an inside seat in the Washington spook world during the Reagan-Bush administration. Former National Security Agency